Welcome to Mythic Muscle, the podcast where we delve into the fascinating worlds of fitness and folklore. I'm your host, Benjamin Cloud, and in each episode, we'll explore the myths, legends, and stories from cultures around the world and see how they intersect with the world of fitness. What I aim to do is provide a captivating, dramatic retelling and set you on your way to a healthier version of yourself. As a powerlifter and a bodybuilder with a deep interest in mythology and folklore, I've always been intrigued by the ways that ancient cultures viewed strength, power, and the human body. In each episode, I'll take you on a journey through a different mythological tale or figure, exploring its literary nature and its relevance to modern fitness culture. And to really bring the story to life, I'll also present a specialized workout program that's inspired by the mythological themes we discuss. So whether you're a fitness enthusiast looking for some new workout ideas, a mythology buff, curious about the deeper meanings behind these tales, or just someone who loves a good story, this podcast is for you. Join me on this journey of discovery, and let's explore the intersection of fitness and folklore together. Hercules, champion of humanity, god of strength and prowess, he who bested labors twelve. Hercules' most dire crime is that of his own bastardry, and what of his penance? the death of his wife and child by his own misbegotten hands. The painfully promiscuous lord of the sky Zeus had set out to once more invoke the wrath of his great queen Hera, the goddess of marital harmony. And so did he lay with Alcmene, a mortal woman, beguiling her by donning the visage of her loving husband Amphitryon. Their labors were fruitful, and soon the pair would cradle in their arms Alcides a name derived from the ancient Greek word for strength. Young Alcides, born of Zeus's divinity, would, as a tribute to a scorned queen, be renamed by his parents to Hercules. Hera's glory. Hera spat at this tribute, viewing it as a brutal jest, and cast her eyes toward ruining the child. She sent her serpents to kill the babe Hercules, and yet they fell one in each supple hand, which belied a mighty vice-like grip. The infant had strength befitting a demigod. Hera would not be satiated until Zeus's bastard was undone. The boy grew, and Hera's fury grew in tow. Soon the boy would become a man, taught by the greatest wrestlers, archers, artists, and musicians the bountiful lands born of the Aegean and the Ionian seas had to offer. He would marry. He would have children of his own. Yet the goddess of marriage, still wrathful of her husband, would not bless this union. She crept, sauntered as a banshee on an evening mistral. In the bed she found the pair. In the Hercules' ear she whispered a nightmare come reality. Hercules awoke, his wife Megara appearing to him as a creature of Hades' creation. He would race to his sons only to find them in the likeness of his former teacher Linus. No, these children were not of his strength, not of his blood. His wife was a duplicitous, vile thing. He would end them. Hera watched from the heavenly heights of Mount Olympus. She watched as Hercules burned his children and slaughtered his wife. She lavished in his grief as her curse lifted, just in time to hear his family's cries. Still, she would not be satiated. Hercules looked upon the devastation his might had wrought and wept. Remorse, regret, anguish, sorrow, contrition. No word in any of history's greatest lexicons could touch upon the grave emotion that befell the now widower Hercules. He traveled, carried by the winds of familicide, from his defiled home to the steppe of King Thespius. The king would absolve Hercules of his crime, but Hercules felt only a journey of self-wrought absolution would cleanse his grief-addled mind. He sojourned to Delphi, where he thought to speak to the oracle Pythia. She gave to him guidance and a mission. Seek out his cousin, King Eurystheus of Mycenae. Serve him for twelve years and do not balk at any trial he sets you upon. Do for him all that he needs and speak no complaint. If he so served, he would be rewarded with immortality. If Hercules could not clear his mind in one man's lifespan, perhaps a hundred more might dull the memory. Despite Hercules not particularly enjoying the thought of serving a man beneath his stature and prowess, he accepted his charge, seeing no other route to forgiveness. At King Eurystheus' step, Hercules bowed in obeisance. And so commenced the fabled Ten Labors of Hercules 
a penance for the inexplicable deed executed by Hera's glory. To those familiar with the more modern tale of Hercules, you might raise an eyebrow at the number ten. Isn't it the twelve labors of Hercules? Indeed it is, but those last two labors were given as a further punishment. See, Eurystheus, who we'll talk more about shortly, disavowed two of the labors completed by Hercules due to him acquiring help during the process. King Eurystheus' first task for Hercules would be one of pest control. A beast of great stature and golden fur terrorized the lands of Nemea, indiscriminately rampaging against crop and crop tender alike. As King Eurystheus owned the farmland, it was in his best interest to see the beast slain, and the farms producing once more. Hercules' arrival provided the perfect solution. Hercules set out to Nemea, where he then began tracking the great lion. His arrows blunted themselves on the beast's gilded hide, and no sword could penetrate its powerful haunches. A great chase ensued, as Hercules would not end his penance without even completing a single labor. The great hills of the Nemean landscape hide many a cave and tunnel. Here, Hercules would make his stand against the lion. Not with bow, sword, fire, or club, but with his own great and powerful fists. The combat was brief and violent, with Hercules backing the beast deeper into the cave. The diamond-edged claws swiping and slashing toward the soon-to-be hero. One glancing blow would split a man in two, and yet, Hercules saw opportunity. He rushed the beast, gripping it under its powerful legs as it swung its mighty claws, pulling it into a brutal bear hug and forcing it to the ground. There, he loosened his grip for a brief moment, just enough to slip his hands toward the lion's howling throat. There, Hercules bore down with his semi-divine strength, crushing the beast's neck with his guillotine-like forearms. Using the lion's very own claws, he skinned the beast and took its impervious hide as his own. A two-fold trophy of his success... He wore the hide as armor and helm. Draping himself in the beast's fur proved to those around him that no feat, no matter how impossible it seems, would be too great for Hercules. Eurystheus, astonished and frightened by his cousin Hercules, refused to allow the warrior into his keep. From there forward, he would use a herald to issue Hercules' labors, all while hiding in a large bronze jar, which is hilarious. Hercules' next labor would be yet again one of beast slaying. This time, he would face the Lernaean Hydra in its swamp lair. With great ease, Hercules found the serpent, and invigorated by the outcome of his duel with the Nemean lion, he immediately began his onslaught, aided by his nephew, Aeolus. Wielding a tree he fashioned into a massive club by hand, he swung with all the ardor of a demigod and cleft the Hydra's head clean from its neck, sending it spiraling through the sky. Yet, this creature would not be so easily felled. Where one head had been, a second head sprouted, and not but a moment later, a third would sprout from that very same spot. Just as Hercules had Iolaus's help, so too did the Lernaean Hydra have friends. An agent of Hera, a giant crab she kept as a pet, rose from the murky swamp depths to snip and cut at Hercules and Iolaus. Hercules' foot had been caught in a great swamp tree root and covered in the filthy murk of the Grecian bog. The crab would seize its opportunity and make an attempt to separate Hercules' foot from his leg. Hercules scoffed at its impudence and brought the weighty club down on its carapace, damning it to death. But this was only one threat dealt with, and not the one which would cause him the most turmoil. He asked for Iolaus' aid with the Hydra, to which Iolaus suggested he might send flaming arrows into the exposed tendons of the Hydra's neck, after Hercules had cleaved a head away. This proved fruitful as the fire halted the Hydra's regeneration, and eventually, after Hercules and Iolaus had rid the beast of its nine heads, he reigned victorious. Yet the ninth head still wriggled in his hands. It refused death. Recognizing its immortality, Hercules buried the immortal head and set off, but not before dipping his arrows in the Hydra's venomous blood. Upon returning to his cousin Eurystheus, he reported his completion of the labor only to be met with Eurystheus' great displeasure. These labors were to be completed without assistance and for no reward. Yet clearly, Iolaus' help won Hercules the day. This labor would go unaccounted for in the completion of the ten labors. Eurystheus demanded Hercules track another beast yet again. This time, he would bring the king a hind of Serenia. This deer of red hide was of particular interest to Eurystheus, as it was rumored the hind bore bronze hooves and golden horns. There was another rumor as well that Eurystheus neglected to tell Hercules of. 
This particular hind was sacred to Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Hercules spent a year hunting the hind, only catching the deer as it finally tired. She would find a place to rest on a peak which stretched into the heavens, thinking herself safe from her hunters so high into the sky. She was mistaken, as Hercules' arrows had flown true, striking the hind in its shoulder, hindering its movement. With haste, Hercules bound its legs and draped it around his hide-covered mantle. Hercules began his way back down the mountain only to be stopped by Artemis herself, who furiously accused Hercules of stealing the hind to kill it and sup upon it. Hercules dropped to his knee and pleaded that he was ignorant of its importance, that Eurystheus was to blame. Artemis relented, but only at the behest of her brother Apollo, goddess of the sun and music, who successfully diffused the situation. She healed the deer of its wound and set Hercules on his way. He carried the deer with him and kept it alive for the entire fifty-mile trek back to Eurystheus' palace in Mycenae. Eurystheus, goading Hercules, set upon him his fourth task. Nearly identical to the prior, he would track another animal down and bring it back alive. Surely if he could bring back a sacred deer of Artemis, he could retrieve for Eurystheus a boar. Except the boar of Arimanthus was no well-mannered deer. Quite the opposite, in fact. The Arimanthian boar had a vicious reputation. It would barrel down from its mountain dwelling and gore the people and animals of the countryside with its massive tusks. It would only return home once everything before it had been destroyed. A beast of such reputation would be easy to find, Hercules thought, and was right to think so, as the boar made no attempt to quiet its rampage. While the boar looked for something to eat, Hercules roared at it, frightening it greatly, steering it back toward the mountain. He had tracked a hind for a full year, wrestled a great lion with his bare hands, tactically defeated a massive hydra. This chase was nothing for him. The boar attempted to hide from Hercules in the mountain's deep brambles, yet Hercules would not be so easily cast off. He thrust his spear into the brambles, pinning the boar to the ground. There, he trapped the boar in a net and carried it back to Mycenae, where he found Eurystheus cowering inside his bronze jar in fear of both the boar and Hercules' might. Quick to rid himself of Hercules, Eurystheus set the hero on a task that might just make the king feel a little better about himself. Hercules would clean the Aegean stables, and to make matters worse and drastically more difficult, Hercules must perform the labor in a single day. A normal stable keeper could clean the stables in half the allotted time. But, as this was no normal stable-keeper, it was also no normal stables. King Augeas, among the wealthiest of the Greek kings, owned most of his great wealth in cattle. Thousands of animals moved from pasture to stable each night. Hercules thought this a fool's errand and would see his efforts rewarded regardless of Eurystheus' approval. To King Augeas, Hercules asked but a tenth of his great hoard of cattle if he were capable of cleaning the stables in but one day. The king had little faith in Hercules, and promised a tenth of his cattle if it could be done. Augeas sent his son to watch over Hercules' efforts. Hercules, not one to misuse his strength, ripped open a hole in the wall of the cattle yard. Then he broke open another hole in direct opposition to the first. He dug trenches connecting the two nearby rivers, and diverted their flow into the yard. The rushing river waters cleansed the stables of their mess, and sent it through the holes Hercules had made prior thus cleaning the stables, but making a mess of the land surrounding the yard. King Augeas couldn't believe it had been done, and questioned if this was a ruse. Hercules told the truth, that he had been set on this labor by King Eurystheus. Augeas did not find the truth to his liking, and refused Hercules the reward he was promised, stating to the hero that if he's unhappy, he can take it up with a judge. And so Hercules did. As the trial commenced, King Augeas' son, enamored with Hercules' might and heroism, told nothing but the truth, that King Augeas did in fact promise a tenth of his cattle to the hero, and that Hercules did in fact clear the Augean stables of their mess before the day's end. The judge, seeing the truth in the young boy's words, ruled that King Augeas must pay Hercules, lest his kingdom be forfeit. King Augeas acquiesced but in so doing, exiled Hercules and his own son from the kingdom. Hercules asked the boy where he would be off to, displeased by his inability to repay the boy, as he was still beholden to Eurystheus' labors. The boy responded he would go live with his aunts in the north, and that proved enough of a response for both to head their separate ways. When Hercules returned, Eurystheus had already heard the news of his success, but stated that, just as Hercules was not to acquire assistance in the completion of any of his labors, he too was not to accept reward or payment for the labor's completion. Thus, this labor, like the slaying of the Lernaean Hydra, would not count as a labor completed. Eurystheus decided that Hercules had done the impossible one too many times. He would task him with something even more difficult. For his sixth labor, 
Eurystheus told Hercules he must force a flock of exceptionally fierce birds to dissipate from their gathering near the town of Stymphalos. Hercules, while journeying to the town of Stymphalos, attempted to drum up some affectation of a strategy, yet nothing had come to mind. This was not a feat of strength, brute force could not see this through. In his tactical musings, he invoked the goddess Athena for her battle wisdom. To his aid, she descended from Mount Olympus with a pair of bronze crotala, noisemakers that could be clapped together to produce a loud ringing sound. Hercules would use this to startle the birds, and then he would shoot at them with his bow, throw boulders, or use his slingshot to disperse them. Though the birds attempted to fight back, their reputation of piercing bronze and iron armor preceding them, they were no match for the gilded impervious hide of the Nemean lion cloaked around Hercules' broad frame. With total impunity, Hercules sent the Stymphalian birds careening through the sky, away from the town of Stymphalos. Hercules returned to Eurystheus triumphant. Eurystheus struggled to find another labor, thinking that the Stymphalian birds would stump Hercules. And so he called upon a story. The story of the Cretan bull. The famed king Minos of Crete ruled over the majority of the islands around Greece. To assuage himself of Poseidon's wrathful waves, he took an oath. Whichever animal Poseidon sent him from the waves, he would sacrifice as a boon to the sea god, to prove his ownership to the throne of these islands, and to stay Poseidon's hand. And so sent Minos, the most beautiful bull the lands of Greece had ever been blessed with. Minos thought it too beautiful to sacrifice and kept it, sacrificing another bull in its stead. Poseidon, as wise as he is wrathful, saw through the ruse and deemed Minos an oathbreaker, setting the bull upon a rampage through Crete, maiming the city, landscape, and the people alike. But Poseidon wouldn't stop there. He would manipulate Minos' wife into falling in love with the bull from the sea, and soon she would bear a child with the head of a bull and the body of a man. Minos imprisoned the Minotaur in the labyrinth beneath his palace in Crete, yet Poseidon's blessed bull still raged. So. Eurystheus told Hercules it would be his next labor to bring Poseidon's bull to Mycenae. Out of all of them, Hercules found this task the easiest. He arrived at Crete, tracked the bull, which of course was no issue. After all, he did track the Nemean lion, the hind of Cyrenia, and the Aramanthian boar. And deftly, he overpowered the bull, drove it into the ground with great ferocity, roped and bridled it, and began on his way. And Eurystheus did not expect Hercules back so soon, and upon seeing the bull, decided to let it go free. He too could not risk the wrath of Poseidon, rending his wealth and kingdom apart. So instead, the bull rampaged the countryside and wound up in Marathon, where eventually the Athenian legend Theseus would kill the creature. But that's a story for another time. While this labor had been completed, Eurystheus had nothing to show for it, so instead he would send Hercules on his eighth labor, to bring back the man-eating mares of Diomedes. Hercules set out with a band of volunteers, his heroism had become the talk of the town, and many would pine for his attention or to fight at his side. Eurystheus stated that Hercules must bring the man-eating mares back to Mycenae, but he did not directly state that Hercules could not acquire help in defeating the owners of the man-eating mares. This would circumvent that pesky little clause stating that Hercules mustn't have any help in completing any of the labors. The group disembarked for Bistonia, where Diomedes, the Thracian war chief of the Bistonese, kept his monstrous horses. Upon arriving, the group quickly overpowered any opposition, and Hercules single-handedly drove the mares back to the boat. But the Bistonese gave chase. And Hercules would not let these volunteered men die for his benefit. He passed the reins of the mares off to his companion Abderos, and began fighting off the Bistonese. Yet when the blood had settled and the fight was over, the mares had eaten Abderos and had begun to run loose. Furious and greatly saddened by the death of the youth Abderos, Hercules sprung after the mares, rounding them up, reining them, and driving them onto the boat. He sailed back to Mycenae, and presented Eurystheus the mares. Eurystheus once again set them free. Hercules, angered by Eurystheus casting aside the mares, which he had lost a companion to acquire, hastily accepted the ninth labor. He and his surviving band of volunteers set off to the land of the Amazons and their ruler, Hippolyte. This ninth labor had sent him to acquire Queen Hippolyte's belt, a war belt gifted to her by Ares, the god of war, for being the greatest warrior among the Amazons. Eurystheus' reason for sending Hercules on such a task was simply to provide him with a gift for his daughter. Hippolyte greeted the hero Hercules as he stepped off of his boat, asking him why he had come. 
He responds with the truth of his labors and his crime. Hippolyte, being a great ruler not only in martial might but in benevolence, immediately began disrobing the belt from her armor. Yet, among the midst of the female warriors, one of them was a stranger. A divine stranger. Hera, still wrathful of Hercules, despite the near decade that had passed, had disguised herself as one of these warrior women. She began to whisper her vile words into their ears, and one by one they fell into a frenzy, attacking the Greeks. Hera had told them that their queen was to be carried away by these Greek strangers, as there's no possible way the great Hippolyte would part with her Ares' blessed war belt without being bested in combat. Hercules had to think quickly. He must have been tricked. The Amazons were riding down the volunteer men with spears and shields and bows and arrows. Hippolyte seemed confused as well, but eventually understood. Hippolyte and Hercules battled. The battle was brief. Hercules slew Hippolyte and took her belt, while the rest of the Amazons and the Greeks fought at a fever pitch around the fallen queen. Eventually the battle would come to a close, as the Amazons retreated and Hercules and the Greeks were free to take Hippolyte's belt back to Eurystheus. Eurystheus proposed what should have been Hercules' last labor, one so great that it would send him to the end of the known world where monsters dwell and roam freely. Eurystheus demands of Hercules to steal Gerion's great cattle, the finest beasts of all sorts shepherded by the monster Gerion himself. It would be a feat of mythic proportions. To do so, Hercules would need to sail across the seas, far and away from the bountiful lands of Greece. He would not be able to do so in a normal shipping vessel, as his journey would be far too extensive for a standard wooden boat. Apollo, who had begun to write songs of each of Hercules' labors, would gift him a unique means of transportation. He outfitted Hercules with a golden goblet, crafted by his own admiration and blessed by the rays of the sun. It would see his journey through, and along the way, Hercules would fight many a deadly beast, testing himself in battle time and time again. This voyage would elevate Hercules' skill to godlike levels. His strength had become so great that he split a mountain in twain. He named the two split sides the Pillars of Hercules, and the great rift in the ground where they had split apart became the Strait of Hercules, which he would sail through to shorten his journey to the edge of the world. Finally, Hercules reached his destination, the island of Erythia. His feet weren't long on the island's shores before Cerberus' brother Orthus set himself upon Hercules. The two-headed dog attempted to rip the hero apart, but Hercules simply bashed him away, forcing Orthus running with his tail between his legs. Word of Hercules' arrival and the defeat of Orthus had reached Gerion, and Gerion would see to it that Hercules be stopped at all costs. Yet Hercules moved quickly, stealing the cattle and escaping Gerion's cattle yard. Ultimately, Hercules' escape would be cut short by the shepherd Gerion, the three-bodied giant assaulting Hercules in an attempt to reclaim his cattle. Hercules was simply too powerful, and with a single shot of his bow, he slew Gerion and began his journey back to Mycenae. But Hercules had not seen the most arduous part of this labor. Returning to Mycenae with the cattle would prove much more difficult than stealing it. At one point, Hercules was set upon by two of Poseidon's sons who were attempting to steal the cattle. Hercules slew them, but the battle was tiring. One demigod was enough, but two would exhaust Hercules. He took rest at Regium, a city in Italy, and while he slept, a bull leapt into the sea and swam toward Sicily. The bull then ran to an unnamed neighboring country, which prompted the people to shout words of warning through the air. They yelled their native word for bull, which so happens to be Italus, and thus the country became named Italy. Or so the story goes. Hercules searched for the bull, but it had already been whisked away. This time another one of Poseidon's sons would be successful where the first two were not. Ariax, a local ruler, had taken the bull into his own herd, and when Hercules arrived, he explained the situation of his labors and asked for the bull returned to him. Ariax accepted his request, but only if Hercules could beat him in a wrestling match. Hercules, without hesitation and with ease, bested Ariax three times in succession, reclaiming his stolen, stolen bull. Hercules had set back to sea, all parts of Gerion's cattle back within his possession. When Hercules could just barely see the cliffs of Mycenae on the horizon, tragedy struck. Another of Hera's tricks, she cast upon Gerion's cattle and Hercules' vessel a gadfly which had frightened the cattle and caused them to scatter across the realm of Thrace. Once more, Hercules would go on to round up the cattle and bring them across land back to Mycenae. 
Upon arriving back to Mycenae, Eurystheus is much older and still in the interest of ensuring he does not invoke the wrath of the gods. He sacrifices Gerion's cattle to Hera and tells Hercules his labors are not yet complete, as he has only truly completed eight. But for now, Hercules should rest and recuperate his strength, as his next labor would be even more trying. After a most likely far too brief respite, Eurystheus commands Hercules to his next labor, to bring him the Apples of Hesperides. The Apples of Hesperides were a gift to Zeus from Hera on their wedding day. To acquire these great golden fruits without deception of some measure would be impossible. Surely Hera would not simply allow Hercules to part with the apples, and while he had become a great hero, he was no match for Hera should she bear down with her full godly strength. Moreover, Hercules hadn't a clue where exactly the garden the apples were held in actually was. He was told that they were kept in an orchard at the northern edge of the world, guarded by the hundred-headed dragon Ladon and the nymph daughters of Atlas, who the apples were named for, the Hesperides. Hercules traipsed about the northern world, searching desperately for the Garden of the Hesperides, all the while enjoying the minor challenges set upon him along the way. A fight with the son of Ares, Kiknos, another fight with another son of Poseidon, Anteus, and yet again another son of Poseidon, Busiris, challenged Hercules to combat. All fell before him, save Kiknos, who was spared by Zeus. Eventually, Hercules would come upon a lesser sea god, Nereus, who had a reputation as a shifter of shapes. Try as he might, Nereus could not escape Hercules' grip. Only when he shared the location of the Garden of the Hesperides would Hercules relent. Hercules found purchase among the rocks of Mount Caucasus, where none other than Prometheus, the trickster god who thieved flame from the Olympians, was imprisoned. Prometheus had been chained upon a rock by Zeus, and each day an eagle would come and devour his liver, which would painfully regrow just in time for the eagle to come again. Hercules, realizing the opportunity and piquing the mind of one who has stolen from the gods before, killed the eagle and asked Prometheus for his wisdom. Prometheus told him that Hera would never allow him entrance to the garden, and if she had, it would certainly be a trap. Yet, Prometheus suggested, Surely she would allow Atlas to see his daughters. And so Hercules thanked the trickster god and set himself to course. He would find Atlas, offer to hold the world and the heavens in Atlas's stead, and Atlas would retrieve the apples for Hercules' gain. All things went to task precisely how Prometheus and Hercules had predicted, but when Atlas returned, he stated he would take the apples to Eurystheus himself. See, Atlas hated the job of shouldering the world and the heavens, and would do anything to part himself of the arduous work. Hercules knew this, and he doubly knew that Atlas would attempt to trick him. Blessed by Prometheus, whose other title is the god of forethought, Hercules deceived Atlas, stating he would bear the load in return for Atlas's help, but as a mortal, his flesh would bruise and his bones would break if he did not don some sort of soft padding. Atlas, understanding, set the apples upon the ground and lifted the earth and the sky from Hercules' shoulders, settling the weight upon his own. Immediately, Hercules slyly swept the apples away and sprint away before Atlas could react. Of course... This is not where Atlas's tale ends, but that is a story for another time. After an uneventful journey home, he set the apples of Hesperides before Eurystheus' feet. Eurystheus, still looking out for himself and still thinking it best not to invoke the ire of the gods, told Hercules he would need to return the apples, as they belonged to the gods, not man. Hercules, angered and exasperated, having fought multiple battles, braved the north, and deceived the entity who holds the earth and sky aloft, reluctantly agreed. It would not prove fruitful for him to give them back to Hera, who would most assuredly be furious at his deception, so he instead would raise Athena once again, asking her to return them in his stead. Athena, in her endless wisdom, obliged. With his eleventh labor completed, Hercules felt the taste of freedom, freedom from duty arbitrated by his pathetic cousin who treated these arduous tasks as a mere act of theater. The taste would sour as Eurystheus gave Hercules his final labor. Eurystheus smirked at the obscenity of it. He would task Hercules with kidnapping Cerberus, the multi-headed guard dog of the underworld. Hercules would see it done. 
The priests of Eleusis were known for their keeping of the Eleusinian mysteries, religious rites sung in devotion of Demeter and her daughter Persephone. That these rites be celebrated, so too would the harvest be great. It was stated that if one should know the secrets the mysteries hold, one should find great happiness and prosperity in the underworld. The priests of Eleusis were quick to aid Hercules, so long as he held oath to the few conditions of membership, and in doing so, Hercules began his journey invigorated. The hero traveled to Tenerum in Laconia, a city otherwise titled the Gateway to Hades. He stood at the precipice of a great cave and with a moment's breath, he flung himself into the dark. As he descended into the underworld, he came across all manners of beasts, monsters, ghosts, and heroes of yore who failed their descent. He bested each of them through physical might and unyielding perseverance. The sprawling expanses of the underworld were perfect footholds for Hercules' titanic stride, making his way to Hades with ease. Upon finding the god of the underworld, keeper of riches and shepherd of the dead, Hercules pleaded, asking Hades for ownership of Cerberus. Hades, not known for many true attachments, replied poignantly that Hercules was free to take the beast, but only if he bested it in single combat. Weaponless. Hercules, without hesitation, but with permission, set off for the river Acheron, where he might find Cerberus dutifully guarding the dock of Charon. As he traveled, Hercules pondered different methods of subjugating Cerberus. Luckily for him, his experience with Cerberus's other family members would give him an edge. The Nemean Lion, the Lernaean Hydra, Orthus, all three Hercules had fought and bested in combat. All three find themselves dangling from the same family tree that Cerberus belongs to. All progeny of the unholy consummation of Typhon and Echidna, both terrible beasts in their own regard. And as the fates would have it, the unwitting Eurystheus and his given labors acted as training tools for Hercules' heroism. He would come across Cerberus, the great hound that guards the gates, his dragon for a tail whipping at the ghastly riverbank. Hercules would set down his club, bow, and sword, doff his lion's hide armor, and charge at the monstrous Cerberus. With a great leap, Hercules landed atop the dog's back and gathered the multiple snarling heads in his arms, driving them to the silty ground beneath him. Hercules had grown greatly powerful through his journey, and this final combat would be a testament to his ferocity. As Hercules held the beast down, suffocating its heads, he had left his back completely exposed. For a normal foe, this would be no issue. But for Cerberus, whose tail was the neck and head of a dragon, this would prove more than meddlesome. In a race against the fleeting life force of Cerberus and the encroaching dragon's maw, Hercules bore down further. The necks began to crack and tendons began to snap. Hercules exploded with a great groan of effort and of pain as the dragon's teeth sunk deeply into Hercules' back and shoulders. Without the hide of the Nemean lion to protect the bare flesh of our hero, the teeth sunk deep, biting like a volley of arrows across a battlefield deeper and deeper until they could drink no further. The dragon tail was the last to let go, as Cerberus had finally lost consciousness under the vice-like might of Hercules' crushing frame. His wounds would have killed a lesser man, and Hercules' asphyxiating grip would have killed a lesser foe. After a brief rest, enough to catch his breath, but not enough for Cerberus to wake, Hercules gathered his arms, flung the beast across his shoulders, and set out for his freedom. He met with Eurystheus one last time, proving the labor complete, and absolving himself of his past wrongdoings. Hercules escorted Cerberus back, as a free man. With the trials twelve bested, Hercules was free to roam the lands or sup on the great fruits of Mount Olympus as he pleased. His myth would inspire the earliest of Olympic athletes so that they might achieve even the smallest fraction of his greatness. Hercules' myth ends here. Of course, he still lives on in all forms of media, but for our purposes, the champion of humanity takes a well-deserved rest. That's it for the story, but if you're here for the fitness, stick around. Now let's pair this with some fitness. I'd like to focus on three of the twelve labors specifically, those being the first labor to slay the Nemean lion, the seventh labor to capture the Cretan bull, and the twelfth labor to subjugate Cerberus. While the others certainly demonstrate aspects of Hercules' heroism, I believe that these three best demonstrate his physical aptitude. Something really cool that happens with Hercules' story is that we really get to see some basic fundamental principles of strength training in application. It's really quite interesting how much ancient cultures knew about hypertrophy and strength even if they didn't quite use the same terms we use today. I suppose, if you wanted to, you could just suggest that they really didn't, and that these concepts displayed are just byproducts of common sense. 
But that's lame, and I really don't think it's the case, seeing as we have evidence of athletes training for the Olympic Games and of course for gladiatorial combat. Inspired by the tetrad method employed by the early training methods of Olympians, I'm going to suggest a four-day split. It also just so happens that there's 12 laborers and you can very easily split 12 into 4 by 3 which is the perfect amount of time I'd recommend adopting this routine for. A three-week mesocycle is a really common practice among bodybuilding and powerlifting trainers in which you hyper-specialize on a training modality for three weeks, aiming to really dial in whatever it is you're lacking on. For example, I'm currently running a three-week mesocycle, small experiment, where I train side delts every day that I train for three weeks. Results are actually quite surprising in both strength and hypertrophy. Starting with the first labor, slaying the Nemean lion, we're given some pretty great insight into exactly what muscles Hercules used to complete the labor. Firstly, he used a bow to attempt to pierce the hide of the lion. Archers need to have really strong rear delts and powerful lats to properly draw their bows, so we'll certainly mix in some vertical pulling. And when that didn't work, Hercules demonstrates the strength of his forearms and biceps by wrestling the beast to the ground and choking it out MMA style. This definitely calls for some curling, and an exercise I'm sure many of you haven't done or have even heard of. But that's all we can really gleam from the Nemean lion. Let's move on to the Cretan bull. Shocker, it's gonna be much of the same. Hercules does a lot of choking things out. Again, Hercules chases a creature down and drives it into the floor. Now where have I heard about that being a thing that people do for sport? Hmm. Oh, that's right, wrestling. It just so happens that wrestling was a huge thing in Greek culture as well, so we can go straight to the history books for this. Typically, wrestlers in ancient Greece spent their time, well, wrestling, but I wouldn't recommend walking into a gym with no wrestling experience and asking to fight someone. Speaking from experience. Kidding, of course. Instead, we'll swap a partner out for a medicine ball and do some heavy medicine ball slams. These are great for general cardiovascular health, but also they're a really great way to get the whole body involved in a movement. If you're a weightlifter, you probably already have a coach telling you to do these, but if you don't, try these out and watch how much the movement transfers strength over to your cleans. Other than that, some horizontal pulling is just generally good for moving weight around, whether that's a person, a multiple thousand pound bull blessed by a sea god, or just a barbell. Moving on to Hercules subjugating Cerberus, the twelfth labor, this one is just totally gonna break the mold. If you can believe it, Hercules grabbed an animal and slammed it into the ground. But this one does actually have another factor to it, and that's perseverance. This is the last labor for Hercules. He's tired, he's done, he's exhausted, and yet he digs deep and he finishes strong. In your own work, be that study, fitness, your career, learn this lesson from Hercules, dig deep and get it done. We'll round out the tetrad with this final day of training. To emulate Hercules suffocating the multiple heads of Cerberus, some sources say three, five, five hundred, it's hard to pick, we'll do some grip work, and we'll finish it out with a bit of cardio, because nothing is more arduous than cardio. So what is this tetrad style mesocycle? Like I stated earlier, the tetrad was a routine employed by early Olympians comprised as such. Day one, preparatory exercises. Day two, heavy training. Day three, rest. And day four, modest exercise. We're gonna mess with this a little bit to more align ourselves with modern sports science. This lines up perfectly with the chosen myths and with a bunch of fundamental training principles. Let's start with day one. I'd recommend a five minute warm up of your choosing, so long as it isn't dynamic enough to impede upon the hypertrophy stimulus brought on by the working sets, it's golden. After your warm up, start with a chest press of your choice, four sets, eight to 12 reps. My recommendation would either be a barbell bench press at RPE 8, RPE standing for rate of perceived exertion, which is just a fancy way of saying how hard each rep is, or I'd recommend a seated chest press machine at the same RPE for the same amount of reps. Think like a hammer strength. There's positives and negatives to both exercises. A barbell bench is really going to hammer your stabilizers, but it's much more technique dependent and thusly is slightly more injurious. A seated chest press is going to train your stabilizers a lot less, but allow you to really focus heavily on the mind-muscle connection. Dealer's choice. Exercise number two is going to be dips or tricep pushdowns supersetted with push-ups. Dips are much harder. There are variations that make the exercise easier, like assistance machines, but I'd recommend if you can't do dips, steer clear until you're strong enough to bang a couple out. Tricep pushdowns are a good substitute, getting rid of the pec activation but really honing in on the triceps, and the push-up superset brings that pec activation back, while still directly targeting the triceps, effectively emulating the dip. If you're doing dips, shoot for RPE 6 to 7, anywhere from 8 to 15 reps, for three sets. If you're doing tricep pushdowns and push-ups, shoot for three sets at RPE 10, take both to mechanical failure. The reason here for such a high RPE is due to the fact that both exercises aren't super likely to injure you. Both are relatively safe, though if you're getting weird elbow pain on tricep pushdowns, don't worry, it's common, but just ease back a little bit. 
Our last exercise of day one is going to be a once hated, now favorite exercise of mine, the side lateral raise. If you want your shoulders to pop out a bit more, give yourself the appearance of a slimmer waist, get that V taper, really achieve that Greek statue look, you gotta hammer the side lateral raises. Side delts heal super fast for most people, and you can go pretty damn hard on them because of it. Small muscles like the side delts are perfect for focused isolation work, and if you look at any photos of Hercules, he's got a massive chest and huge shoulders. Take these side lateral raises close to failure, somewhere around 10 to 20 reps is going to be enough to really light up the shoulders for most people. You can go heavy on these, though technique is everything for this exercise, more so than most. If you look at some of the highest level bodybuilders with the biggest shoulders, you can see plenty of them doing side lateral raises with 20, 30 pounds. It's really all technique here. Aim for three sets, it's the end of the workout, these are gonna burn like crazy, but it's worth it. On to day two. This is our heavy training day, and the one I think Hercules most likely would have benefited from. Five minute warm up here, of your choice, get blood into the muscle, get the joints to stop creaking, and get to it. Exercise number one, starting with my absolute favorite exercise, the lat pull down. Heavy lat pull downs really light up the entirety of the latissimus dorsi, and more than anything, they feel really nice. Four sets for eight reps, RPE nine. Hercules typically closed his arms around whichever beast he was fighting, so we're gonna use a close grip handle here. You can use the single-handed individual grip attachments and just use two at a time if you don't have a V-shaped handle, that's totally fine, but really focus on getting that deep stretch at the top, pull the muscle apart, and touch the grip to your chest. The top stretch is the most hypertrophic part of the exercise, it's your best friend. Exercise number two, chest supported rows. My second favorite exercise, four sets, eight to 12 reps, RPE eight. I really, really like training back. Okay? Okay. These are great for the spinal erectors. The upper middle part of the back, the lats, the biceps, they're just great. Focus on the deep stretch, roll your shoulders forward at the bottom, maximally lengthen your back, and pull it hard and athletically toward your chest. You can do these with dumbbells on a bench if you don't have access to a machine, but they're much, much nicer on a chest-supported row machine. Pause briefly at the top for a second or so and focus on the eccentric or the lowering part of the exercise. Exercise number three, strict bicep curls, four sets, reps to failure, a range of 12 to 15 is perfect here. Giving $10 to whoever can tell me what muscle the bicep curl targets. Slow and controlled eccentric, we're doing these strict so that we can't cheat the concentric part of the movement at all. The biceps have a lesser known effect in strengthening the shoulder complex. If you've got chronic pain in your shoulders, bicep curls can help strengthen the shoulder without directly moving the shoulder joint around, albeit quite minimally. Exercise number four, seated rows, superset with cable face pulls. Three sets of both exercise, RPE eight, eight reps of seated row, 12 reps of face pulls. Seated rows are really powerful in lighting up the entire upper posterior chain, much like the chest supported row. And face pulls really target the rear delts and traps. If you're gonna be bear hugging hellhounds, you probably want a strong upper back. On to day three, rest. Listen, you don't build muscle in the gym. You build muscle when you sleep and when you're relaxing. Get quality rest in, socialize, spend time with your family. Living in the gym is not the best path to a good life. And of course, eat well. Day four. This is our modified modest exercise day. Now there's a ton of definitions of modest. This routine is gonna follow my definition. Exercise number one, heel elevated squats. You can do these with a barbell. You can do these with dumbbells, do them with kettlebells. Don't care, get your heels up, get deep. Not ATG, but beyond parallel and get back up. Four sets, eight to 15 reps, RPE eight. Heel elevated squats typically tend to help out a lot in folks with poor ankle or knee mobility. They're a lot better in targeting the quads for my fellow long femur friends. And overall, they pose a lower risk of injury because you won't be using as heavy weights as you could in a typical barbell back squat. For Olympic wrestlers and heroes of myth both, the quads are a huge driving force in overpowering an opponent. Don't neglect your legs. Exercise number two, RDLs, the good old Romanian deadlift. I prefer these with dumbbells as they allow for a more natural flexion of the lower back. And again, you'll have to go a little lighter, which will be in turn less injurious. Four sets, 10 to 12 reps, RPE eight. Hamstrings, lower back, grip, upper back, abs, biceps, rear delts, RDL's got it all. They're one of my favorite exercises for strengthening the entire posterior chain, and they focus on that weighted stretch position, which is again, the most hypertrophic portion of the exercise. If the quads overpower your opponents, your hamstrings will let you withstand their onslaught. Slow, eccentric, steady, focus on form, keep it nice and tight. Exercise number three, kettlebell swings, three sets, 20 reps, RPE seven. Kettlebell swings are a criminally underrated exercise and dually underperformed. They're a powerful tool in any lifter's arsenal. They're a dynamic exercise involving the whole body. They force stabilization through the core and the glutes and they hammer the lower back if done properly. I love these damn things and they fit perfectly into the training styles of ancient Olympians. 
Exercise number four. Exercise ball bear hug to failure. Warning, you will look strange. Now, I didn't believe in this exercise until I did it. It is wild. You take an exercise ball, you latch your arms around it, connect your hands in a wrestler's grip, and just squeeze it until you absolutely cannot squeeze anymore. Full effort, maximum strength, it's terribly effective at building static strength. I lifted this from Eric Bugenhagen, which he may not be a lot of people's speed, but I highly recommend his channel because it's hilarious and Eric is insane, does insane things with the human body that are just downright awe-inspiring. Do this exercise just once. One set, one rep, all out, full force. It seems strange, I'm aware, and you'll look super weird if you're doing it in a packed gym, but maybe find a studio if you can, and just go to town. If you can pop the exercise ball, you 100% do not need this program because whatever you're doing is leagues better than anything I could ever produce. A great substitute for this is a pec deck fly in which you load a ton of weight, get a friend to help you pull the bars into position, then you simply resist the eccentric as the cable pulls the bars back. It seems strange, but wrestlers love this. That's the end of the Tetrad, and so it starts again. After completing day number four, feel free to take a rest if you really need it, but I would recommend jumping right back into day one's exercises the day after. After the end of this three-week mesocycle, I guarantee you you'll see progress both in strength and hypertrophy. With that, I have been your host, Benjamin Cloud. This has been the Mythic Muscle Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. Take care, folks. Please consider supporting me on Patreon. For only $3 a month, you get Discord access, and you buy me a protein bar. $5 a month lets you Discord access with special colors and emotes, blooper reels, a shout-out for me, and transcripts of each episode. $10 a month gets you all of that noise, a vote in our monthly poll, a personalized 10 second clip of whatever you want me to say, and every dollar spent at that tier goes right back into the podcast so that I might bring you a better listening experience. Follow my socials. You can find me on pretty much every platform by searching for Mythic Muscle Podcast and looking for the helmet crossed with a barbell on the microphone. If you made it this far, you're my favorite type of human, and I hope you have a wonderful day, a fantastic lift, or if it's a rest day, you get some quality relaxation time.